Hello, thanks for tuning in, and welcome to this video on non-convective low-level wind shear. This video will discuss the causes of non-convective low-level wind shear, as well as how to fly it, and also how to find it on weather charts and maps. In other words, your flight planning for non-convective wind shear. So the causes of non-convective wind shear are the same as the shear turbulence we talked about earlier this semester. And those were temperature inversions, surface friction, and fronts. First, let's take a look at temperature inversions. With nocturnal radiation inversions, uh, when the sun sets, of course, the ground gives up its uh, radiation. Actually, the ground is radiating all the time. It's just that at night, there's no incoming solar to balance the outgoing infrared. So, um, as a result, the ground cools with this loss of energy. And the temperature profile that uh, you had earlier during the day, uh, the temperature usually decreases with height. But, when the sun sets, the air that is in contact with the ground cools as a result of conduction. And then early in the morning, you get a strong temperature inversion that's usually about 1,000 to 2,000 feet deep. Sometimes it's less. It depends upon the amount of cooling and also the strength of the winds. Here is a strong temperature inversion that occurred at Bismarck, North Dakota under clear skies in October of 2021. And it shows a red line and a blue line. The red line represents the temperature profile. Notice uh, the red lines also that are, uh, that are kind of skewed. Uh, those are temperature lines, uh, starting with 40 degrees Celsius on the right, and then moving all the way to minus 40 on the left. And the uh, blue line represents dew point. What you can see is that temperature increases from about 5 degrees Celsius at the surface, which is about maybe 975 millibars, all the way up to about maybe 22 degrees Celsius, which is uh, probably somewhere mm, around um, uh, 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then it rapidly decreases above 900 millibars, which is probably about 3,000 feet. Field elevation at uh, Bismarck is about 1,600 feet. So this inversion is in the lowest 1,000 or 2,000 feet AGL. You usually find this when you have high pressure because with high pressure that implies uh, clear skies and drier conditions. And uh, if you have um, stronger winds aloft, uh, when this inversion sets up, it decouples the atmosphere so the winds on the lowest layers of the atmosphere decrease and it sets up a stronger shear. So if you have this shear that develops with stronger winds aloft and lighter winds down low, um, that usually occurs over a short distance, as I mentioned, uh, below 1,000, uh, 2,000 feet, but sometimes it could be over just a 500 feet. And with a strong shear like that, that can also induce um, problems with performance if you're arriving in airport. Of course, you can also get turbulence with this, and we discussed the problems with turbulence before. The next cause of wind shear that we'll discuss are low-level jet streams. The low-level jet stream, by definition, is a jet stream that is typically found in the lower 2 to 3 kilometers, which is about 6,000 to 9,000 feet of the troposphere, and it usually occurs at night. So that's why uh, sometimes it's called a nocturnal jet. The low-level jet stream is very common in the central United States, uh, in other words, the southern plains, central plains, and also all the way up into the northern plains of the United States. And there are two causes. Uh, one is uh, the cooling at night as the sun goes down. As a result, the wind decouples. In other words, it's not affected by friction as much anymore. Not only that, but also the terrain cools off to the west, so it sets up a pressure gradient that causes a strong southerly wind. Um, you'll notice this wind about maybe 1,000 or 2,000 feet AGL. It may be blowing anywhere from 25 to 50 knots, whereas the surface may only be about 5 knots or calm winds. 
Another reason or another cause of the low level jet stream is when you have a strong low pressure system moving out of the Rocky Mountains. With that, that produces a strong southerly flow as a result of the strong pressure gradient. You'll notice winds that are 50 to 75 knots, but as the sun sets, uh, as a result of the decoupling, you'll have much lighter winds at the surface, but much stronger winds aloft, producing strong shear in the lowest layers of the atmosphere. Here is an example of the low-level jet stream that results from a strong pressure gradient across the central U.S. It shows that there is a trough, a low-pressure system in Manitoba and Ontario that stretches down as a trough across uh, Minnesota, Iowa, uh, down into Missouri, and even Oklahoma and Texas. And with that stronger pressure gradient, you've got uh, stronger winds, winds that are out of the south. Now this is an 850 millibar map, so that's about 5,000 feet. And it shows the winds across this area are probably about 40 knots uh, across the central or southern plains of the United States. Next, we'll talk about how surface friction causes low-level wind shear in the lowest layers of the atmosphere. Meaning that wind blowing over the ground uh, you know, decreases as you get closer to the ground, the speed, because of friction. And usually this happens at lower altitudes. Uh, usually 500 feet and below you'll see an exponential change in wind speed, but little change in wind direction. And this is the most common type of wind shear that you see and the most common type of performance loss typically on approach. This happens all the time during the winter time when we get really strong winds, especially northerly winds behind a cold front. And um, you know these are gusty conditions. And um, you'll see aircraft, especially larger airplanes, reporting performance loss. And uh, the reason for that is because larger airplanes, heavier airplanes, have more momentum and they can't adjust, they can't change their momentum fast enough. There's not enough force uh, to change the momentum. And as a result, uh, they'll experience uh, a loss of airspeed as they approach the airport. So, of course, with stronger winds, you get stronger shears in the lowest layers of the atmosphere. Winds uh, 25 knots or greater produce really strong shears, and uh, the shear gradient is, is uh, severe. And normally you'll see this during approach and landing. During departure, it's not so much a concern. Uh, remember that during departure, you've got performance increasing as you climb out because you're experiencing a stronger and stronger headwind. But coming in for a landing, that's when you've got a problem. So no problem on takeoff and departure because it's performance increasing. So things you look for when you're forecasting or concerned about uh, shear caused by surface friction. Of course, pilot reports are invaluable. METARs and the ATIS or the surface chart, wherever you can see winds and a pressure gradient, will uh, really help you uh, anticipate this. And then, of course, this is forecasted in uh, the uh, AirMets and SIGMets, actually, also. And also you'll see uh, LLWS forecasted in TAFs if it is considered to be severe. Here is a case from years ago with a strong low pressure system that moved over the upper Midwest, as you can see. And the winds across North Dakota are out of the Northwest, but over Minnesota and Wisconsin they're out of the South or Southwest as this, this low moves. And I think there's probably an associated front with this also. It looks like it's right across North Dakota but this analysis doesn't show the front. Here you can see that there is an AirMet out. Uh, this is AirMet Tango uh, and it's been updated six times uh, because of the changing conditions for uh, turbulence across North Dakota, South Dakota, but also um, they mention in this that there's um, you know, occasional light occasion, occasional moderate turbulence below 15,000 due to moderate low-level winds around this low-pressure system. So these aren't the strongest winds. The winds are you know, up to maybe 20, 25 knots, but uh, still regardless, uh, there is significant shear. Here are, the, um, here are the TAFs for this area, the Duluth, Minneapolis. You can see the winds are forecasted to be gusting up to 35 knots, uh, but uh, 
during uh, a good chunk of the day the winds will be you know less than 25 but there are peaks where they're greater than 30 or 35 knots and here are the pilot reports that came from uh, locations across the area these are uh, uh, well actually these are not the pilot reports sorry these are the METARs showing you the strength of the winds and the winds on this particular day Duluth were gusting to 32 um, Eveleth were gusting to 32 and St. Paul gusting to 29 all out of the southwest up, uh, out ahead of this approaching low also another thing to consider is look at the peak winds in the remarks section and you can see that uh, the peak winds are you know 35 uh, knots it looks like at least in Duluth and up in St. Paul they're up to 31 so now here are the pilot reports for this particular day for aircraft going into Eveleth, Duluth and St. Paul and they're all reporting um, low-level wind shear and they're all indicating uh, severe wind shear um, up at uh, Eveleth there's an airplane flying from uh, Duluth to Eveleth uh, at 5,000 feet and uh, reporting light turbulence at 5,000 and moderate at or below 3,500 and they said uh, during descent at Eveleth uh, at 400 feet they lost 12 knots of airspeed at Duluth an F-16 landing at Duluth experienced low-level wind shear plus or minus 15 knots on final approach to runway 27 at Duluth and at St. Paul there's an urgent pilot report um, a King Air 200 reporting uh, low-level wind shear lost 15 knots uh, 300 to 400 feet uh, during descent uh, to runway 27 at uh, St. Paul. So um, during the winter time it gets pretty exciting with uh, strong winds and low-level wind shear for large aircraft. Notice that there are no small aircraft reporting low-level wind shear. Typically it's large airplanes that have high momentum. The last place that we'll look at where you can experience uh, low-level wind shear is with fronts. And we mentioned this before we talked about it, that fronts are a zone of strong stability and also strong shear. That's between two different air masses. And down low, typically the shear is directional. Um, you, know, you will have strong winds, but uh, the shear that you're looking at down low is directional. So when an airplane penetrates a front at low altitudes, we're talking below 2,000 feet AGL, it's going to experience shear. Typically the shear with cold fronts is performance increasing because as you're landing, you're landing into the wind and uh, you, know, uh, you will experience uh, at higher altitudes uh, you know, some shear, but uh, typically cold fronts are steep enough unless they're right on top of the airport you won't have the problems with shear you'll more than likely have problems with surface friction but not so much with shear with cold fronts but it can happen so you need to look at the charts warm fronts since they slope more gradually tend to be more of a problem and we talked about the slope of a warm front being 1 to 200 so for example if there's a front within 20 nautical miles of an airport then um, the uh, front will be found 0.1 mile or 600 feet above the airport and that is a concern especially you know during final approach or departure uh, so let's take a look at a couple of examples um, one thing is um, you need to consider which runway to take off from um, and anticipate the shear that's associated with uh, the warm front and you know if the warm front is close to the airport here we're looking at 20 miles but even you know if it's a little bit further still depending upon the slope of the front you could have some issues with uh, departure so the things that you look for uh, you look of course at the surface chart and you also look at the upper air charts you know if you have a 925 uh, millibar chart or um, you know an 850 that would be extremely useful METARs of course uh, and not just METARs for your airport but also for the surrounding airports and then finally uh, pilot reports are invaluable and then uh, for flight planning uh, for forecasts you're looking at airmets, SIGMETs, uh, terminal forecasts and also your SIG weather progs give you some information uh, about uh, fronts 
Here's an excellent example. This is uh, Kansas City. We're going to focus on Kansas City. As you can see in this uh, surface chart, there's a warm front that stretches from South Dakota across uh, Kansas with an associated low pressure system in South Dakota. And this doesn't look real threatening. I mean, it, it doesn't look like a real intense low pressure system. Um, zooming in a little bit closer, looking at the winds, um, you can see that uh, out in western Kansas at this time, this is 13 Zulu, uh, the winds are out of the west. For example, at Hill City and Goodland, uh, Russell, they're all out of the west at 5 to 10 knots. That's about 200 miles from Kansas City. You can see that the winds are switching around at Salina, and for that matter, matter Russell, they're out of the south or southwest. So that puts the front from Kansas City about 200 miles. Here are the uh, METARs going from um, east to west across uh, Kansas. And Lawrence, Kansas, LWC, is very close to Kansas City. And you can see the winds are out of the uh, south at 6, not real strong. Um, and then as you move across, there's uh, FOE is um, Topeka, Kansas, Forbes Field. And the winds there are 210 at 13, gusting to 19. You see as you go farther west, Manhattan is 230 at 10, and then Goodland way out west is 280 at 5. So they eventually switch around to the west. You can see that uh, progression associated with that warm front. Here's your 850 millibar chart. Now this is up at 5,000 feet. And I put Kansas City on there. We're looking at airport, uh, airplane taken off from uh, Kansas City International. And you can see the winds are 45 knots at 5,000 feet, and they're out of the west, due west. So you remember looking at uh, Lawrence, which was very close to Kansas City, the winds were down low at the surface out of the south. Well, this is what happened at Kansas City on this particular day. Um, looking at the wind reports, the winds were 130 at 10, 150 at 10. So they're out of the southeast uh, at this particular time when the air, this airplane departed. It was a 737. And the 737 elected to take off on runway uh, 9, which would give it a 45 knot crosswind. Uh, uh, 45, not not, but 45 degree crosswind. Uh, if it took off at uh, 10, uh, 35, if it took off uh, later, and this aircraft actually departed about uh, 13 Zulu or uh, 14 Zulu or so, and it had a pretty healthy uh, crosswind. Um, it had about a 70 degree crosswind, but the winds were not real strong. They're only six knots, so that is not much of a concern. You don't have a real strong crosswind, so. This pilot elected uh, to use probably runway 9 because it would give them uh, a straighter shot on their route. Uh, they could pick up their uh, route, uh, you know, get on their route and uh, faster, and it would save them time rather than taking off on, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the north-south runways. And this is what happened. Here's the pilot report. Actually, it was an MD-80, not a 737. Uh, the 737 reported later on at higher altitudes. But uh, an urgent pilot report for this particular day at uh, 1328, now this is when the winds at the surface were out of the southeast at about 5 to 10 knots. Uh, aircraft reported at uh, flight level uh, 1,500 feet MSL. Uh, Kansas City uh, Airport sits at about, uh, about 1,000 feet uh, elevation. So this is 500 feet AGL. An MD-80 departing remarked they departed runway 9 and they experienced a 50 knot tailwind and they also got a wind shear alert uh, in their cockpit. Um, you know, there's a wind shear detection equipment uh, that works off of accelerometers. So it was going off. It told the, air, uh, the flight crew that they had wind shear and they had <laughs> significant wind shear. They had a loss of 50 knots, close to 50 knots, they had a tailwind. Um, so um, uh, you can see um, that you know they went through the front, and they, as they were climbing out very close to the runway, they went through the front, and the wind swished uh, very quickly 
from the southeast at 5 knots to the west at 45 to 50 knots. And this was confirmed by 737 at higher altitude, up at 7,000 feet. They are saying the winds were 41 knots. So um, these are things you have to consider when you're departing an aircraft, uh, departing a, an airport, uh, which runway to select based on the orientation of the warm front and then also um, with winds at altitude. So you can't just look at the winds at the surface if there is a front nearby. In this case, the front was 200 miles away, but still um, it did affect uh, the aircraft at Kansas City. The last cause that we'll discuss of low-level wind shear is what we'll classify as other local effects. Local winds such as gap winds, sea breeze winds, and also valley breeze winds can cause low-level wind shear in local areas. Gap winds are classified as locally strong winds that accelerate through gaps in the terrain. So in other words, uh, you have uh, a mountainous range or maybe even a smaller uh, ridge line with uh, a lower area where the winds accelerate. There's a big pressure gradient uh, from one side of the ridge or mountains to the other. Uh, that usually results from cold air on one side and warmer air on the other. That cold air is very dense and gravity will pull it through and cause it to accelerate. As you know, uh, sea breezes are winds that blow from a large body of water to the landmass. And this typically results from the land heating up. Um, and as a result of that warmer temperatures over land, you get reduced pressure. So over the water, you have higher pressure. Over the land, you have lower pressure, which causes the wind to blow from, of course, high to low. And that causes wind to move in from the sea towards the land. Typically, this is where you see the development of cumulus clouds and even thunderstorms. This is very common in Florida. You see it most uh, common, uh, most often in Florida during the summertime, but also even the Great Lakes, you can actually see this occur. And of course, this reverses at night, this flow, because the land gets colder and the water stays warmer as a result of the terrestrial radiation loss by the land mass. And finally, valley breezes are winds that ascend a mountain valley as a result of the heating of the mountains. As the mountains heat up, the temperatures increase uh, in close contact with the mountains. Uh, the air heats up, becomes less dense, and starts rising. And that can cause a shear in valleys. And that concludes this video on non-convective low-level wind shear and the causes of the wind shear. Go to my YouTube channel. There are more videos on non-convective wind shear uh, that deal with other things such as uh, flight planning and also the physics of wind shear.